wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, good evening. Glad you came back to be with us tonight. Glad that Larry and Quay Roberts are not skipping church. I'll call Eastland and tell them you did go to church even though you're out of town. So glad to have you all here. Glad that all of our visitors are here. Thank you for being with us tonight. We are wrapping up a series on Sunday night called P Paul and the Three Bears. You know, Paul talks about three ways in which we must bear. We must bear one another's burdens. We must bear our own burdens. And tonight we're going to look at bearing the brand marks of Christ. You remember a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday morning lesson, we talked about how everyone has a scar, probably. And we all have a story behind that scar. You know, whether you were doing something silly like playing baseball with a football and a pine log and you swung and you hit the football with the pine log and it shattered and stuck in your chin. I don't know what person would do something that foolish, but uh, maybe you have a story like that or, or maybe you're some foolish person that was uh, climbing a ladder to do some work uh, overhead and you had a crowbar and it slipped and hit you in the, in the head and left a scar. I mean, I'm just speaking hypothetically, of course. Uh, I don't know of anybody who would ever do something that silly. But uh, maybe you have a scar that tells a different kind of story. All of us probably have a scar that's, you know, visible, that there was a story behind it. But then, of course, there are other scars. There are scars that maybe are not as visible. You know, for instance, some of our soldiers come home from war with terrible mental scars, mental trauma. They suffer from PTSD. Some of them have maybe physical scars as well, maybe even the scars from loss of limbs or something of that nature. But there are many scars that are not so superficial, that are underneath the surface, that maybe we deal with that no one really even knows about because they're suppressed and we feel like we can't show them to the world. Paul talks about scars that are visible. He talks about bearing the brand marks of Christ, but he also, within that, talks about some scars that are not as visible, also within the realm of bearing the brand marks of Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 17. This is where we have spent the time talking about these, these marks that we are to bear, these burdens. In Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, we talked about you know, bearing those burdens of one another. We talked about bearing our own burdens. But in Galatians 6 and 17, Paul says, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Christ. Have you ever noticed that the letter to the Galatians is really Paul venting his frustration? If you've ever read Galatians from chapter 1 to chapter 6, you notice that Paul is getting frustrated with the, with the Galatian brethren. You see, it seems that apostasy has set in. Paul closes his letter by giving a rather sharp admonition. This phrase in Galatians 6, 17 indicates an agitation, if you will, with the Galatian brethren. The letter is punctuated with criticism, at least in part for the saints' lack of diligence. For example, Paul mentions those who were so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. That's chapter 1 and verse 6. He also wrote, there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That's chapter 1 and verse 7. The original language here indicates an apostasy is in progress. False teachers had come in and enslaved and, as he puts it, bewitched the Galatians with a Judaistic gospel. And as a result, some had turned on Paul. And apparently, some adversaries viewed him as if he were the enemy. Now, this perplexes Paul, as Galatians 4 and 20 tells us. And so, he issues a rebuke to the Galatians in chapter 6, uh, excuse me, yeah, in chapter 6, verse 17. And he charges them to stop causing trouble for him. That they shouldn't be his enemy, they should be on the same side as him, working for the same cause. The word trouble here is the Greek word kopos, and it primarily denotes a striking or a beating. In Galatians 6 and 17, it's used metaphorically for distracting a person's attention by causing him embarrassment or precipitating worry. Paul did not need this stress in his life. He had endured enough trouble already. And this leads to Paul saying, For I bear on my body the brand marks 
of Christ. Now the present tense verb bear here is the same word that we have talked about before. It's the word bastazo in the Greek language. And it marks, uh, it, it, it talks about marks that are visible or marks that can be seen on the surface. And it's as if Paul is issuing a challenge here by saying, look at my scars, take a good look at them. You might could imagine him pulling up his cloak and showing them his back where he's been whipped so many times. You can imagine how disfigured Paul's body was. Would not have been much to look at. Probably very grotesque and something you wouldn't want to see. And it's as if Paul is saying, look at these marks. Look at what I have endured for the sake of the gospel. Have any of you done that? Have any of you bore the brand marks of Christ the way I have? Now, if you use the New American Standard Version as I do, the word is stigma. And stigma can mean a few things. Stigma can refer to a brand as when a master branded his slave. And many people think that's what Paul is referring to here. He is referring to being a bond slave of Christ, and therefore he is bearing that brand. Stigma could also refer to a tattoo. We know that the pagans used to tattoo the names of their gods on their bodies. So perhaps Paul is referring to a tattoo that he bears on his body of the name of God. I don't think so, but it could mean that. Or it could mean, and what I think it means here, is a stigma is related to the plural form stigmata, and it's a scar resulting from wounds. And I think this is more likely what Paul is referring to, that the brand marks for Christ are those wounds, visible marks that he bears on his body because of the persecution that he has had to endure for preaching Christ. You know, it's interesting to note that the Greek literally reads the marks in my body. This certainly seems to imply more than just a superficial mark. Scripture corroborates Paul's description of bearing the brand marks of Christ. In Lystra, we know that he was stoned, and then afterward he was dragged through the city and left for dead. That's what Acts 14 and 19 tells us. One would think that this type of torture would leave lasting injuries. I can imagine Paul probably walked with a limp, maybe hunched over, as he tried to recover from all of the broken bones that he suffered was preaching Christ. At Philippi, Paul and Silas were beaten with many stripes and with rods. You keep in mind that while Jewish law limited beatings to 40 stripes, the Romans had no restriction. They could beat you as many times as they wanted to. And so you can imagine what Paul had to endure at Philippi as well as in other places. Paul also writes of receiving stripes above measure, suggesting both many in number and of great intensity. You can look at 2 Corinthians 11, 23 and following for that. In addition, he received five beatings by the Jews, none of which is recorded in Acts. Each of these produced 39 wounds, thus no less than 195 stripes from these five beatings alone and countless scars. Three times he was whipped with rods. No doubt this torture would have left scars as well. Not even a skillful surgeon such as Luke could have repaired his terribly disfigured body. But not all of Paul's wounds were superficial. Not all of them were things that you could see on the outside. Paul tells Timothy that Demas had left him and left serving with him because his attachment to the world was so strong. And then he goes on to write, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul defends his apostleship by giving a resume, if you will, of all the things that he has had to endure for the cause of Christ. He talks about being beaten, whipped, put in prison, shipwrecked, thirsty, hungry. And then he says, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. He says, who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? There is no question that Paul knew what he was talking about when he was talking about bearing the brand marks of Christ. And not all of them were external. Some of them even were internal. You know, in the days of chivalry, the medieval knights would come requesting a demanding task that they could do to show 
that they were brave and courageous in order to earn the honor and love of the object of their desire, the lady that they were trying to impress. That is similar language here of what Paul is talking about. Paul viewed his suffering as a way to show God his bravery and his courage. Paul looked at his suffering as a way to kind of impress God, if you will, to show him that he was serious about his commitment. He saw suffering as an opportunity. I don't know if we always view it that way. I think for many of us, if not all of us, stigma is a, is a word that carries a very negative connotation. In our society, stigma is something that you don't want to be uh, afflicted with. You don't want a stigma associated with you or your name. You know, stigma may be a black eye on your reputation. It may be some sort of health issue that you have to deal with. But whatever it is, stigma is not a welcome thing in our culture. How many of us bear the brand marks of Christ? How many of us have visible scars that we can point to to show, yes, this is what I have suffered for my Lord? Very few of us, if any, perhaps. I mean, we could say, well, we just don't live in that day and age. That's not our culture. And I agree. Most, if not all of us, will never have to endure the type of persecution, even close to what Paul had to endure. It is very unlikely that any of us will ever have to bear any kind of scars, visible anyway, as a result of persecution. We know that we have brethren in other countries that are facing severe persecution. Some are being thrown in prison, some are being whipped, some may even beheaded because of their faith in Jesus Christ. But that's not us, that's not our reality, is it? But, don't you think, that if we are truly a child of God, and if we are truly denying ourselves and taking up our cross daily, that we should face some sort of persecution? And if we are a child of God, and if we claim to be a Christian, and we haven't faced any type of persecution, should that say something about us? Should that say something about our daily walk with God? I mean, Jesus had some encouragement for the people of his day. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of this world, because of this, the world hates you. You know, it's not getting any easier to be a Christian. I mean, you look around your world today, and you're often viewed as someone who is reviled, or someone who is against the rest of the world. Many times the name Christian is a stigma, isn't it? You know, it's getting harder and harder to make a difference in the world around us as a Christian. People are not as receptive. In fact, many people are very resistant to anything that is in favor of God or the teachings of Jesus. We know we live in a culture now that calls evil good and good evil. We live in a culture that's trying to silence the Christian voice. We live in a culture that doesn't want to hear about morality or biblical authority. We live in a culture that, much like in the days of Judges, does whatever is right in its own eyes. It's not getting easier to become a Christian. And at some point... Christians have to be willing to be bold and courageous to stand up against whatever opposition there is to say, no, this is the way it is. This is how I believe. This is what's important. This is what is godly. This is what is righteous. And therefore, this is where I stand. Obviously, we can do that without being violent or terroristic. We can do that without being even um, hateful or malicious. But we've got to be able to stand. You've heard me say before, at some point the church has to win, doesn't it? I mean, when in your life does the church win? I realize I'm preaching to the choir, but I mean, that's what we would ask of anyone who claims to be a Christian. When does God win in your life? You know, we talk about all the other things that we're doing from day to day in our activities. When does God win? When does church win? Because it should win. It should always win. It should always be first place, but so often it's not, right? Right? 
And so it's not surprising that, that Christians don't stand. That maybe we try to mix the two, the world and our Christianity. We try to straddle the fence, so to speak. We try to have the best of both worlds. We want to stand for Jesus, but we also don't want to be too offensive to the world around us. We don't want to show too much of Jesus because that's offensive. But you can't have it both ways, can you? This is an all or nothing proposition, as you've heard me say time and time again. We're either on the side of the Lord or we're on the side of the world. We're either making a difference in the world by being a light or we're making no difference by trying to straddle the fence or just blending in with the world around us. There are too many spiritual chameleons that just blend in with whatever's surrounding they're in. And that shouldn't be us. We should be a people who are willing to stand for Christ no matter the cost. Are we willing to do that? And if we do that, do you think we're going to face some persecution? Absolutely. What kind of persecution? Well, you're probably not going to be whipped. You're probably not going to be beaten. You're probably, at least now, not going to be thrown in prison. I'm not saying that would never happen, but at least not now. So we're not going to face the type of persecution that Paul faced. What kind of persecution may we face? Young people, you may face verbal persecution for standing up for Christ for standing up against peer pressure. You may face being ostracized from a friend group. All of us may have terrible rumors spread about us. We may even lose a job. But at the end of the day, we have to stand for what is right and face whatever comes our way, knowing that we're standing on the side of Christ, knowing that we're standing on the side of God. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, it reads, For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Understand that to be a Christian in the first century was not about being a good person. It wasn't about going to church every time the doors were open. If you were a Christian in the first century, you will be persecuted. That was the message, really. You were going to be persecuted if you were a Christian in the first century, in some way, shape, or form, whether outwardly and physically, or maybe more mentally, emotionally, in those kind of ways. It wasn't just about being a pretty good guy. It was about suffering. 1 Peter 2.21 states, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. To follow in the footsteps of Jesus meant suffering, and it probably still means that today. And we're not talking just about suffering in a physical sense related to physical malady. We're talking about suffering as a result of persecution because of the one that we follow. You know, we still live in the Bible Belt. We live in the buckle of the Bible Belt here in Abilene, Texas. And so maybe we are sheltered from a lot of this that we're talking about this evening. You know, even when I lived in Missouri, I could preach a lesson on abortion, and I'd have a few of the congregation, maybe even 10%, 20% of the congregation, not happy with me. I come down here, you can preach lessons on biblical morality, and you get almost 100% amens, yahoo, thank you. But there are other places where, even in our churches, Christ is not well received. Maybe we don't face the persecution like others do in our world, in our country even. But is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? You know, we, we, we pray, and I think we should. Thank you, God, for being able to come and worship without fear of reprisal, without being persecuted. But would we be okay if we were persecuted? What if we did have to face that? Would we be all right? Absolutely, without a doubt. You see, I think one of the mistakes that American Christians make is we feel like we have to have the protection of the government. We don't have to have the protection of the government. I hope we have it. I want it. And I think we need people in politics to fight for it, but we don't have to have it. The church will always stand, and the church will always thrive. Do you realize that in China, the church is growing? 
It's growing. And it's not even a legal religion there. You can't even practice Christianity legally. The first church grew under circumstances that it never should have grown under. The first church faced some of the harshest persecution and it still grew. It still was thriving. We'd be okay. But here's the thing. I'm not so sure that being free from all persecution is a good thing. As I've said before, I'm not going to go pray for it. But I think maybe sometimes we just need a good dose of it. Maybe that would help us. I don't think it would hurt us. You know, it's unfortunate that that all too often Christians are silent about what they believe and who they believe in. You know, there is no such thing as secret service when it comes to our devotion to God. If we proclaim to be a child of God, then what we proclaim should be shown in the way that we live, the things that we say, our behavior. You know, I spent a lot of time watching tennis this past week and watching this one particular gentleman on the other team, and he got pretty, uh, pretty upset. He wasn't playing well. Anytime somebody would hit a good shot on him, he got really upset. And, you know, can't blame him. I probably would have broken my racket a long time ago. But I was standing close enough to hear him talking in his dialogue. I mean, he wasn't keeping it to himself necessarily, even though he wasn't shouting it either. And his language wasn't real good. It was laced with expletives. He was pretty upset that he wasn't playing well. And this, this happened the entire match. And at one point, I'm standing by the fence, and he goes over and reaches down to pick up his ball, and there is his chain hanging with a cross on it. And I thought, we got to do better, don't we? I know the world gets the best of us sometimes. I know our anger gets the best of us sometimes. I know that we can lose our temper. You know, I know that those things happen, but we've got to be aware. We've got to be aware of, of who we represent. If we're going to wear a cross, it's not just a trinket, right? We are to take up our cross daily. We are to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow after him. And if we do that to the fullest, we're probably going to face some ridicule, some mocking, some persecution of some sort. And that's okay. If you have a need tonight that we can help you with, if you're not a child of God and you're ready to set up a Bible study, maybe you're ready to put on Christ in baptism. Let's take care of that tonight. Maybe you've been struggling with something, you need the prayers and support of this church family. As we say every week, do not leave here without being right with God. And when you do leave here, let's go change the world. Wade's going to lead us in a song. Come now if you have a need while we stand and sing.